Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me in the back? Uh, this presentation, my part of this presentation, is Monk's Murder and Mayhem, the portrayal of the clergy in Umberto Echo's The Name of the Road. Uh, I expect that some of you may not have read this book, or if you have, it might have been uh, quite a while, so I'm going to give a quick overview of the plot, and I'm going to keep the outline of the topics fairly uh, quick and fairly simple. This is not a simple novel. I taught this novel, uh, the, to be honest, hadn't heard of this novel until I uh, taught a literary detective fiction class. I was looking into more recent detective stories with some literary merit. And uh, my career, I've, I don't know exactly, taught probably between 40 and 50 novels. And uh, I really think this might have more intellectual depth than any of the other great novels that I've taught. It's uh, very complex. I think it's tough for students to read uh, because there's so much history. There's so, I mean, it's, a, it's a clearly a work of brilliance. Well, who is, I mean, was Umberto Eco? It was only this morning that I found out that he died in February of this year. Uh, so I don't know why I couldn't believe he is. But he was a many different things. He was kind of a Renaissance man, a historian, philosopher, a literary critic. He started his career as a serious thinker, I believe, uh, writing about music art critic. He wrote about pop culture, including uh, such subjects as comic books, Superman and Felix the Cat. He wrote about James Bond novels. Uh, he's a media theorist, internationally uh, respected best-selling novelist. This book in Italy, uh, my numbers are somewhat dated now, but it's sold I think half a million copies in its first few years in, in hardback. In the United States, it first sold a million copies in hardback, and then over a million more in various paperback uh, editions. And it's really, this amazed Umberto Eco because he did not think popularity was something that would, would come to him. And I find it's amazing, too. I think it's interesting that it's made into a, a, a successful Hollywood film because it is such a deeply intellectual uh, novel, truly. He wrote children's books, wrote of anthropology, scientific achievements, technological achievements. He's probably most important, though, in the history of uh, Western thinking for his contributions to the field of semiotics. And uh, very loosely, semiotics is the study, it's the interpretation of system of signs or symbols as conveyors of meaning. And this is proliferated into uh, through com computer languages. I would embarrass myself if I tried to explain how it works, even as literary criticism. Uh, a, a simple example in cultural uh, semiotics is that we read signs in such things as the clothes people wear the way they style their hair. And those examples are indicators that sometimes the signs that we interpret are incorrect, or uh, they, they, they can be uh, deceptive intentionally. Uh, I taught an English 1101 textbook that was grounded in cultural semiotics, where basically it's called Signs of Life in the USA. You might have encountered that book. And uh, it interprets our pop culture. Why do we? Why did we have a few years ago this craze where there were so many uh, successful books and films and TV shows centering on vampires? What was it about? What did that signify? Uh, I think that had, at least the theory of the text I used was related to the, the financial crash uh, or the, you know, the economic problem. 2008. Why are, are zombies such a popular thing? Come on in, Jeremiah. We, we saved you a seat down front. So. Uh, an obvious and important example of a semiotician is the detective. 
the detective interprets uh, signs that we call clues. And in a nutshell, uh, not exactly a plot summary, but an overview of the story of The Name of the Rose, we have at this moment in history, which I believe Dr. Reese may illuminate more uh, precisely, but there was conflict within the church with, between the, the Pope in particular and the Franciscan Brotherhood uh, that basically centered on a, a dispute on whether Jesus owned proper. Can I pick up and sure. say why this is a big deal? So, it would be very hazardous to your health in the 14th century to answer the question of did Jesus own a wallet? Because, as we might remember from our Bibles, those of us who are in the Christian tradition, what does Christ tell his followers? Give everything you have to the poor and follow me. And indeed, in the early 13th century, Francis of Assisi, this wealthy young man, felt this calling, read Christ's command to take nothing for the journey, to go begging, to live with nothing as Christ lived, and he did this. He went out and he preached with nothing but the coat on his back that was a recycled blanket, went barefoot, and this motivated people. People saw this man living in this desire to live in holiness and apostolic poverty, poverty like Christ and his apostles had lived. And so this became an order. The man, Francis of Assisi, Francesco is his nickname, founded this whole new order of friars in the church. And what a friar is is basically like a monk, but instead of living in a monastery, they go out and they preach. They go out and preach and they live among the people. They live in the streets. They don't own property. They beg for property. They, but they mainly they preach as well. They're very strongly about preaching and leading by moral example. But, but as the Franciscans became this order of preachers who are known for their holiness, who are known for their simplicity of life, suppose that you are a rich person in 13th century Europe. And suppose there are these people who are known for their holiness, for their poverty, who live by begging. What are you going to do in order to do a good deed? You're going to give them money. And this becomes a problem. They're an order dedicated to poverty, but everyone wants to give them stuff. Because everyone sees their Christ-like poverty and wants to give them money. And so, eventually they become very prominent. They become university professors. And it's kind of funny to imagine a university professor who owns like one recycled blanket that says clothing and goes barefoot. But that's what they became university professors. But gradually people kept giving them property, especially things like books, Bibles, prayer books. So their whole order was dedicated, though, to not owning property. You know, birds have nests, foxes have dens. The Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. So what do they do? Well, very smart men in the church figure out a distinction using Roman law between ownership and use. The Roman church, the Roman Catholic church, which is mostly the only game in town in the Middle Ages, appoints a cardinal protector, that is, a cardinal, they're like super bishops, and there's one man who owns all of the goods that you give to these Franciscans. He's their protector. Now the Franciscans use these goods, but there's one guy in Rome who actually technically owns them. Now, among Franciscans, this starts to become really controversial. What if you're supposedly poor, you own nothing, you live by begging, but a rich man takes you into his house for steak dinners and red wine, are you really poor? You don't own anything, you're living off other men's generosity. So you start to see disputes. You start to see the question of what does it mean to be poor? And eventually, in the early 1300s, especially in the reign of Pope John the 22nd, dates of 1360 to 1364, during John the 22nd's reign, what you see is that now there are some Franciscans who are saying that this ownership on behalf of the order and using stuff, that this is turning aside from the mission that Francis 
confounded. This is turning aside from that poverty. And in fact, certain Franciscans begin insisting that those who say the church can own property are in fact the voices of the Antichrist. That this is not true Christianity. That true Christianity is a Christianity of apostolic poverty. So now you have a group saying, yes, we can use things as long as we don't own them. Others saying that use without ownership is nothing but a sham. And the church and the Franciscans must be poor. And to claim the church can be wealthy is to be the Antichrist. That is the dispute we have in the church of the early 1300s. Yeah. Uh, and the, the political ramifications here, there were two sides to that. Uh, the novel is there's to be a meeting of representatives from Pope John the 22nd and from the Bavarian ruler who would shortly, I believe, after uh, the date of the story, become the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Louis the, the Fourth, uh, that we're going to meet to discuss this question because the, the, the church uh, was the wealthiest game across all of Europe. The amount of wealth that, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm sure Dr. Reed could give us more precision, but they, they tended to, at various points in different countries to have much greater wealth than any of the nobility, than the, the crown. Uh, Often it would be a third of the land right. given to give the kingdom. Right. Not only that, the church was entitled to one-tenth of everybody's income. We call it tithe. So on top of their land ownership, they got one-tenth of everyone's income. And the emperor, the secular emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, it was in his interest for the church not to have its wealth. So he supported the arguments of the, the Franciscans, uh, thinking that, well, the, the, the less for the, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, then the more for me. And of course, the, uh, the church, with all this wealth, did not want to let it, even a, a tiny fraction of it go away. So enter our protagonist, William of Baskerville. You may recognize that name, Baskerville, from Sherlock Holmes stories by Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, one of his most famous, The Hounds of Baskerville. And that's not an accident. William is a, uh, he is a Franciscan friar, and he is a retired inquisitor. And Dr. Reeves didn't say a good bit about the inquisition here in just a bit. He was a student of Roger Bacon, who was uh, an important figure, and some, I think, would say loosely that he's kind of a, a founder of the, the scientific method of using uh, sensual, uh, sensory observation and then the, the applying thought to it. Well, at, when William shows up at the Benedictine monastery where this conference or disputation is to take place, uh, the abbot is upset and very glad to see him because there has been the death of a monk. He, has, he thinks he's been murdered. He's been tossed from a high window in a tower of the abbey. And uh, with William's past as an inquisitor and his famed powers of intellect, he becomes a detective to, to solve the, the murder. The, the novel is narrated in the first person by a character named Adso who travels with William of Baskerville and is a Benedictine novice, that is, he is in training to become a monk. And if you look at the vowel sounds just of adso, or even maybe in, in the French, his name Adson, sounds remarkably similar to Watson. Sherlock Holmes stories you, uh, you may know are narrated by, uh, by uh, Dr. Watson, and it became a convention of literary detective fiction to construct stories the way that Arthur Conan Doyle did, where you have a narrator who uh, may be somewhat helpful to the detective, but is a little bit dim. It doesn't, it, it basically the function of the, it became called the Watson character, is to uh, describe events for the purpose of illuminating the brilliance of the, the detective, the Sherlock character. There are lots of specific uh, tips of the cat to uh, 
Sherlock Holmes stories, there's it's a, a standard feature of detective fiction to have what's called a curtain raiser, where early in the uh, story, the detective demonstrates his brilliance by figuring something out that would be impossible or, or seemingly magical. And so, in the name of the rose, in the very first chapter, I believe, William of Baskerville, they, they encounter, uh, they, they see some monks following a horse that has escaped, and by, through pure deduction, the amazing powers of the, uh, the brilliant detective, William deduces that this is the abbot's horse and even determines the horse's name is Brunellus. Uh, to I mean, the, the curtain raisers to show the brilliance of the detective. Uh, at one point, the detective says, he doesn't say elementary, my dear Adso, but he does say elementary. Uh, the Watson character often inadvertently solves a mystery or by accident says a clue that the detective goes by Joe Adso, you have solved. We, we see that in this case. Uh, but it's about the detective's power of deduction. And shortly after they arrive, William of Baskerville realizes, deduces that the death of Adelmo, the monk that was thought to be a murder, was actually a suicide. And he figures that it was a suicide that was committed from the monk's shame because he had engaged in homosexual activity with another monk. Uh, and it's because the, it was basically a trade so that he could have access to, to books. Uh, then that each day, for the, the novel takes place over seven days, each day a different monk is found dead, and it seems to be, it's sort of a, a random suggestion by a senile old monk, Alonardo. He says, well, the first one died in a storm, the second one is found face first in a barrel of pig's blood, the second one, but uh, he, he makes the... Uh, assumption that what's happening, these are signs of the apocalypse. Each one the, from the, the book of Revelation, the first one died in a storm, the second one in pig's blood, the third one in water, the fourth was killed by an armillary, which would be a, a metal uh, spear of concentric spheres that reflects the heavens, uh, you know, planets or stars or whatnot. Well, over the course of the novel, William solves the mystery uh, he solved several mysteries, actually. Uh, the, the, at the heart of this abbey is the, the library, and this is the supposed, supposedly the greatest library in Europe. Uh, but it's strange, it's arranged in, as a labyrinth. It's a maze where uh, and only the librarian and the assistant librarian have access. I see Robin smiling. Only the librarian and assistant librarian have access to the stacks, to the books, and any of the monks that uh, sneak up into the to the library to try to, to look at books that are forbidden to them otherwise encounter very strange occurrences. Uh, they see ghosts. Uh, they have visions that are uh, nightmarish. Well, William solves the mystery that one of the things that makes where they, they, they see other beings, there's a distorted mirror. So if somebody walks in this one room, then you know it, 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 it frightens them. In another room, there's uh, herbs that are uh, smoking that lead to hallucinations. But he discovers that uh, ultimately, all these dead monks, not a one of them, well, one of them was murdered, but the, the sequence uh, each day of the, the strange circumstances, the monks having ink stains on their tongue and their fingers, is traceable to this one, to the librarian, whose name is uh, Jorge of Burgos, and he is, uh, his name, this is actually a reference to the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges, pronunciation. Uh, Borges, he is a uh, notably pessimistic. Uh, in fact, uh, Echo calls him a tragic pessimist uh, who believes that monks should not ever laugh. There's another theological dispute over not just was Jesus poor, but did Jesus ever laugh? 
Uh, he's a serious-minded person that thinks that monks should spend all of their time uh, preparing for the end of times, that the apocalypse is coming. So William solves the mystery. He gets his man, but he misinterpreted all the signs. He, it's an accident that he solves the crime because he thought he was looking at the signs of the apocalypse, the, the storm, the blood, the water, the heavens or the formulary, and thought that someone, for some reason, well, it, it turns out that it was, um, I mean, it, it was an accidental discovery through Edso just making a comment about a dream that he had that led him to, to the right conclusion. So the detective solves the case, but his powers of deduction, his uh, theory of the crime was utterly inaccurate. Uh, one thing that I think the novel is interesting, and it's a, the above all the novel, is uh, a search for definitive proof. And I think there are some interesting small truths that are, the novel reveals uh, in details of the portrayal of the life of 14th century monks. For instance, the structure of each day's uh, hours, they, they were called, were around eight different times to pray. Uh, there were three prayers that were to take place at night. Uh, there were uh, matins, lauds would be early morning, prime would be prayers, the early morning prayers, the monks would get up and pray, go back to sleep. Uh, then they would have more prayers when they got up later in the morning to work. Three daytime times for prayer. Uh, vespers, the afternoon or early evening, and compline prayers at bedtime. Very regimented. The, usually the particular psalms or uh, the prayers that would be said would be routine. Uh, there's novelty in such new inventions as a fork. <laughs> the only fork that the Abbey owns, I believe, is, is something that the Abbot is very proud of, and he offers you know, some of his uh, more uh, respected guests, would you like to borrow my fork? Something he's <laughs> kind of showing off. Uh, they didn't have clocks. I know in the film they do show a, an hourglass. I don't think there's a reference to that actually in the novel. But I found this interesting that you know, they have to get up in the middle of the night to say prayers. How do they know what time it is? So in, in the novel, I'm not sure about the historical accuracy of this. I suspect it would be accurate. But the, uh, there's a, a, a rotating schedule. Certain monks would have to stay up through the middle after the last prayer of the night and recite certain psalms a certain number of times to, to measure the time elapsed or when it was time to uh, to wake up the monks for their first morning prayers. You see this in a lot of different things. You see this even in recipes. When a recipe tells you how long should you prepare something, it will say, say the Lord's Prayer three times. So these this is a way you kept track of time. Another thing is you also see this as a nocturne. So you'll have a dial that you can essentially keep on you and you can match it up with the stars so you can tell what time of night it is. Well, it's not the Pierre and Echo's novel. That was one of the ways you would tell time in the early 14th century. And this is also the time clocks have not reached northern Italy, but they do get invented right around the end of the 1200s. And we can tell that because in the very late 1200s, we have one man writing saying, we've almost figured out how to make a truly mechanical clock work. And about 15 years later, we have the first pressure of the mechanical clock. So we can narrow it down to this band or sometime in the late 1200s. The uh, echo was, was accurate here, it appears. Uh, you know, I don't want to be struck by lightning or anything, but a lot of my times, especially as a young man going to church, just one hour a week, I would find myself dozing. Uh, and in these monks there, uh, you know, being woken up in the middle of the night to pray, and, well, falling asleep was something of a problem, even for monks. Uh, so there was, according to Echo, uh, one monk would carry a lantern, would walk among the praying monks, and if he saw somebody that was nodding or was asleep, he would hand the lantern to that monk, and then he would take his place. 
the formerly sleeping monk would then walk around to find someone else sleeping, and <laughs> so uh, thought that was interesting. Uh, there's a primitive understanding of such things as that uh, William shares the how a compass works, or that a compass works, not understanding exactly you know, why it points to, uh, to the magnetic pole. Uh, there's a belief in visions, and that's the character Abzo. He sees this artwork that depicts, uh, well, part of it depicts the apocalypse, and he has a full-blown, almost a, a hallucination. This was one type of truth. Uh, there was the belief in the devil's literal responsibility for crimes, and uh, this is something that inquisitors would look for proofs of the, literally, the devil's uh, involvement. The novel portrays the reality of uh, sex between monks. You have all males from, you know, men will be men or boys will be boys. Uh, he portrays uh, sex between the monks and at least the in the novel, the peasant girl who lives up to ensure that these things would happen. This monk, I mean, this monastery normally has 60 monks and I believe 150 uh, people who worked in the abbey that were from the surrounding community. And I can talk a little bit about the moral theology of the time can show us same-sex activity in monasteries because confession was a big part of Roman Catholic, in Roman Catholic Christianity of the day, in Catholic Christianity, if you committed a certain type of sin, the kind of sin that's so great, you lose your salvation, you have to confess it. And when you confess to a priest, the priest will give you penances to make you right with God, a set of prayers or fasts or routines to reorient yourself. The question is, how does the priest decide how to deal with the confession? How do you counsel someone who's trying to work through sin? And so you have these guides for priests, and these guides will tell us so much about sexuality. They will tell us about things like when you are examining someone, asking what sins they've committed, don't get too detailed so as not to give them ideas, but you should inquire just probingly enough that you get them to say everything, because this confession has to be complete. But you will see these guides to understanding, for example, if monks are, if it's usually monks having same sex active, because you'll see these guys say things like, if it is sodom, um, please forgive me, this is going to be a little indelicate. The guides will actually say things like, if the sex between men is between the thighs, they shall do this level of penance. If it is complete sodomy, that is um, penetration, there is a different set of penances or prayers you assign. You'll often see things not just for monks having sex with monks, but for nuns having sex with nuns. In fact, you'll see these, these legal procedures that say, if a nun has sex with another nun by means of a device, the Latin is per machina mentum, then they are each to do seven years penance. Also deals with things like monks having sex with lay women. What penance does the monk do? Yeah, um, farm boys having sex with cattle. And these, these guides to penance, though, they tell us all about the sex that people were having that they technically weren't allowed to be having. Yeah, well, always an interesting topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this novel is a detective novel, and every detective novel is a, just, it's a seeking to discover the truth. Who done it? Maybe why they did it? Where, you know, where are the stolen goods? It's a search for truth. This novel is, uh, in many far, more profound ways, at its heart, a novel about the search for truth in all kinds of different realms. And uh, the Middle Ages, I don't, in, in the English department, we often refer to the Middle Ages as the age of faith. And uh, I know the Roman Catholic Church were, in Western Europe, they were purveyors of the definitive capital T all the way across, truth. Uh, I mentioned the Dominican Abbey has a great library, but allows only two, like a librarian and his assistant, up into the stacks to get the books. The monks who work in the scriptorium, who are either copying, remember this is before the printing press by 150 years, so all texts had to be manually copied. Some of them were employed in translating, 
some of them are employed in what they called illuminating or more or less illustrating text. They would go to, they would go ask Robin, can I please have this text? Robin would go upstairs and say, here it is. But they also determined which text could, they had, the, the library is arranged in, by the continents or the known world at the time. And so they had symbolically all of the collective wisdom of, of all the cultures of the known world in books. But as the purveyors of the, the one and only capital T Roman Catholic truth, the custodians of the divine word were also the censors, the books that were not allowed. There, this was not a uh, public lending library, and so that's a, a part of the curiosity that would lead the monks to, uh, to sneak, try to sneak into the library, uh, why it seemed haunted and protected by magic. Uh, I mentioned before the, the two primary disputes. Uh, did Jesus and his disciples own property, and did Jesus ever laugh? Uh, the dispute of whether Jesus ever laughed, there the, the, ends up the solution to the mystery of the people who died that were thought to be murdered were not. Uh, there is in this novel, supposedly, Aristotle published, you, you might have heard of Aristotle's poetics where he gives theories of drama and tragedy. Uh, well, in the novel, he also had a, a work, a, a part two of the poetics, in which he theorized, uh, he wrote about comedy. Uh, and I mentioned that your day was all about the grim preparation for the end times and thought that laughter was, was profane. So, and he wants to protect the, in preserving the true knowledge, did not want to sanction something that he saw as heretical uh, that, that, that Jesus might have laughed. So you know, he, he's trying to keep this knowledge from, from everyone, even to the point of poisoning people if they, uh, if they did read it. These are not really knowable questions, I don't think. Do we know if Jesus, owned, or at least according to his portrayal in the novel, and part of the brilliance and the difficulty, I think, of the novel is that the people that argue both sides of both of these questions are brilliant. And they can cite precedent from all kinds of actual historical sources. They can take one little teeny passage from the book of Acts or Matthew and make an elaborate. Uh, they are all practicers of rhetoric, which is the art of persuasion. Uh, so both sides on both questions make really convincing cases, but these are unknowable truths. And this is also a part of the way the medieval educational system worked. When you went to school in the Middle Ages, you trained by disputation. You would be required to argue one point and then present all the evidence for it, but then you would be required then to argue the other point. And the university masters would grade you based on how well you argue. You would even have Christian clergy taught how to argue against the Christian religion. Why might you do that? So you have an answer. Yeah, what if, what if you're a pastor and your parishioner says, I don't know, is this true? If you've been trained to argue both sides, you're a better pastor that way. So this is a very big part of the medieval educational system. And that disputation argue one, argue the other. And then usually in the educational system, the master will then say, and here is the solution. Uh, in, in the search for the definitive truth, uh, it's very much complicated in history and in the novel too by a proliferation of competing truths through primarily uh, religious sects. And I know it's very simplistic, but in a sophomore lit class, uh, I mean, we tend to focus, when we draw the line of the Protestant Reformation is where the, the one Roman Catholic Church, which in Western Europe was Christianity, those two were synonymous. Uh, after the Reformation, there's a proliferation of all of the different uh, denominations we have today, Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, and so on. But, uh, man, the proliferation here, and I'm just gonna give uh, a, a quick handful 
of different sects that have characters that either in this novel that were members of these sects or some of the sects predated the, uh, the time that the, the Friars Minor, also known as Minor Rites, uh, literally the, their title means inferior brothers, they followed literally the rule of St. Francis of Assisi, a strict observance of chastity and poverty. They were not to wear shoes unless there was a serious need for wearing shoes. <laughs> Uh, they were not to use money, no coins, they were to live by alms, uh, that is, charity, they were to fast, uh, they were to gently, to be gentle in their correction of each other's instruction of vices and virtues, and this Franciscan order still, still exists. Fraticelli, uh, a branch of the Friars Minor, means little friars, uh, they were also called the Brothers of the Poor Life. Uh, kind of a splinter group, they were considered heretical. The spirituals, this is another Franciscan sect that were also uncompromising in their following of the original rule of St. Francis. Uh, they were, one of the distinguishing characteristics was their certainty of the impending apocalypse. And these were the ones who denounced the institutional church as the Antichrist. Uh, Two other groups, the Waldensians and Umiliati, these were two sects, they were not clergy, but they were uh, laymen. Uh, the Waldensians, I think, were merchants, and the Umiliati were war workers. They were regarded as dangerous and declared heretics. They were, lay preachers were considered a, a threat to the, to the church. Cistercians, this is a group of Benedictine monastic order. They lived uh, with a very strict interpretation of Benedictine rule, long fasts, little sleep, hard manual labor, uh, banning gold ornamentation and rich vestments. They were uh, less interested in learning than the Benedictines uh, more generally and more just in prayer. Arnoldists, a radical sect advocating the total abandonment of riches and worldly power. They rejected the power and the hierarchy of the church and declared invalid any sacrament administered by a cleric owning worldly possessions. Uh, the shepherds, huh? and these, do you want to describe that? Well, the pastor who were essentially this, um, they were this movement that grew up in response to the Crusades. You first see them in the mid 13th century. Crusades, these wars against Muslims so that Christians can take control of Jerusalem and the Holy Land. And these pastors, who, they, they, they hear this preaching and they get really fired up for this and they wind up eventually taking this, this energy and applying it not to going out on crusade, but to launching this kind of social revolution. And it leads to this kind of chaos, this looting, this rioting before it's put down. And then you see another record, another outbreak of that early in the 1400s. So, and again, these are people responding to this energy of the church saying, you need to go crusade in the Holy Land, and they're just not quite interpreting it the way the church is preaching it. Yeah. Uh, Catarists, Beghards, Beghards, which were nuns, actually. I'm going to skip to the uh, sort of nuns. Yes. Uh, to the pseudo-apostles. And this was a, a sect that, in the, in the novel, Fra Dolcino was, uh, had been the, leader, the, the second leader of this sect, and some of the characters in the novel actually participated in their activities. They believed in obeying God alone, they practiced absolute poverty, they saw the church as corrupt, and they rejected its authority, they pillaged from the wealthy, rioted, uh, they wanted destruction of property because not only did they want what it, they should have it, if there was wealth and wealth was on at least uh, I think in all of these groups except for the Friars Minor I believe were declared by the, the determiners of the one true capital T truth were con considered heretics. 